All right, this is the last bit, so I want to keep it short and interactive. Um, and let me introduce uh, Shane, who spoke earlier, and Dan Berner, who, um, what's your title? Oh. You're, he's in charge of a lot of stuff Chief at Expedia. Troublemaker at Expedia. You, you run the graph, or I, I don't know. Um, we've been working together for, uh, uh, since late last year, I guess. Um, Shane told that story, how Expedia saw the value of the graph really early, um, built a lot of the graph management technology that uh, we've been talking about. Same story, a lot of what we've done is inspired by uh, what we learned working with the team. And uh, it's just been a real privilege to, to get a chance to collaborate. I think, um, Dan, maybe if I can just put you on spot for a minute or two and, and tell your piece of the story. Uh, we've heard a lot about the technical side of this. I think it might be a nice capstone to hear from more of a business perspective, how do you see the value? And maybe a really practical point is, what led you to get behind a project like this and push for, you know, there have been a lot of engineers working on this, a lot of investment, probably a fair bit of risk um, in a lot of people's minds. How'd you approach that and what, what advice do you have for, for the teams here that are probably approaching that conversation too? Uh, thanks for the intro, and I just want to say at the outset that like it's so exciting to be part. This is you know this is the most GraphQL enthused people I've been around since the since the November summit last year. So it's it's a lot of fun to feel the vibe. I'm I'm really enjoying it. Um, you know, XP's been around for a long time, right? We spun out of Microsoft a billion years ago, and I was there near that beginning. Um, and we, you know, we were around, those of us, when the big SOA movement happened, right? So we were like, yeah, we services, and then all the different clients. So, we, you know, SOA was a step up, and then REST was a step up from these big giant C++ monoliths we used to write. When, uh, when we started doing our PWA, um, and we, we really wanted to have these very lightweight clients, and we wanted to push all this stuff back to the server, and as Shane tells the story really well, like, how are we going to scale this out across the size of our company? Um, so when we looked at GraphQL as sort of a, just a much more generic way of handling that problem, um, I mean, right off the bat, I mean, and we're going to touch on this, I bet, as we just start to riff on this, but there's so many things um, that start to happen that click into place. Matt's intro I thought was really good, but the, the one that, that every time it comes up I think is underappreciated is when your client code doesn't know where the data is coming from, um, all kinds of good things start to happen. Because when you've got, you know, even I'm sure Convoy feels this, at 20 services and six clients, it's a pain when you want to make a change and somebody wants to version or some piece of, you know, um, God help them, they were probably cloud native from day one. We, of course, were not. So all of those services, think about them. They're moving through different incarnations. They're changing versions. They're moving different instances. They have different region strategies, all that endpoint management. Um, you know, Jim worked on the mobile team, and like half of the, of the work the mobile app team would do had nothing to do with creating experiences for customers, because they were just constantly figuring out what APIs they could call, onboarding to those APIs, managing them, dealing with schema breaks, the whole nightmare. And it just becomes, it's not fun, right? You're not developing stuff for the customer. There's a lot of overhead. So when we started to see these things, we realized that, like, that if we didn't get our hands around um, not just the tech, right, but how we would use this tech to enable the customer experience we wanted. Um, we were just going to be in a place that wasn't a lot of fun. And, you know, you can grind away at a problem um, for a certain number of years, and then it's just tiring. And at the scale of our company, uh, we, we really saw an opportunity to sort of lean into this. And at the same time, we'd finished about a half dozen years. I don't know if I've even told you this story. We spent about a half dozen years a while back really embracing test and learning culture. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge deal for Expedia because before that, basically just the level of hierarchy that you held decided if you got to control the product experience. So the VPs and the senior directors, they defined what the products were. And it's that auteur theory. And if they were good, we got great products. If they weren't so good, we didn't get such great products. But we brought in a test and learn culture and that just meant mass experimentation, lots of data, which was great. But it also meant that everybody started to do everything differently. So if we wanted to bring that, what we got is those fragment experiences. We got experiences that were fundamentally different across every team. And then every team was trying to catch up. So we have a new great feature. We want to add like multi-room support so you can buy multiple rooms as you go through because you've got a big family. Okay. 
Android's got to do it. iOS has got to do it. The web's got to do it. Desktop's got to do it. And it just got to be, again, I mean, I, it's silly, but it is. It's not fun. You're not actually del delivering value, and it's a big waste. And you end up, the solution that Expedia had was, well, I know how we can fix that problem. We just hire more people. <laughs> So we just did that year after year after year, and teams go from 700 to 2,000 to 3,000. And that's just, but that's just creating another problem, right? It's just, um, so, so we, all that attention on the customer experience came about the same time we had this BFF experience with PWA. And we saw that, um, and at the same time, I guess I'll introduce one more part of the story and then I'll wrap. We also added in a design system the last year into our front end. So we finally had a unified design system that we wanted to apply. So all these piece parts came together and we realized, you know what, if, this, if we put this together, we actually have a tech strategy here that we can use to, to get a cohesive experience. Our usability people were like, you know, we've been looking at this in the labs for years. We really want to create an experience that's not necessarily exactly the same in every touch point, but it makes sense and it's seamless. So we did something that you know, big companies often don't do, which is we step back and we decided to really lean into this, that we didn't really want to do this as just um, one team off in the corner, that after we did our POCs, we went after the biggest part of our business, which is our lodging hotel business, to prove it out. And then we went um, with great support from our tech leaders, like we just decided to go across the whole side of the company. And now the challenge is, and, and this is where maybe I can feed back, Federation at the technology level is awesome. Man, federation at the planning, the design, the community level is the next level of challenge, right? Because we don't, as a core team, and I'm part of that core team, we don't want to tell all the different teams how to do what they do, right? Because it just doesn't scale. It just doesn't scale. Um, and again, then we're back to the auteur theory of like, oh, we know what's best. So what, we're been, what we've been about, what's top of mind for us is the, how to get the tech, um, to solve some of those, some of those negatives and mes that the convoy guide presented, which were great, into goods, but then also to, to how to work together in such a way that we can start to work together on what is good, what is good in GraphQL design. Um, so for us, the, the customer, like really, and our past experiences kind of led us to, to, uh, to lean into this in a, in a really scalable way. And, and the reason that the partnership happened was we had these big aspirations for how we were going to take the work we had done on the hotel space and spread it across the, the whole enterprise. But we didn't have a real plan for how we were going to scale that up. And our backlog, which is really his backlog, was big, right? We had, we had done our own schema stitcher, but we hadn't done the schema validation. We hadn't done the registry stuff. So again, to the point, I think it was James that made about like every time you do a really cool home-built tool, like Apollo comes along and does a sort of a more robust version. Uh, that's just a win-win for the whole community. So it's a great partnership, I think, between an open source model and you know, a commercial model where you guys can, can hire devs so that we don't have to. Um, so it's a long-winded way of saying that, that kept our eye on the customer. We looked at our past, at what had worked and what didn't, and, and this, is where, this is where we're led. And we're really excited, uh, just, just to go back to the first thing I said, just that separation of the services and the clients we think if, if only that happens, even if our graph wasn't that beautiful and it wasn't perfectly you know, orthogonal and clean, if we can keep those, those client services separate, it's gonna open up a whole other future for us that we can use to evolve. And I think one, one quick thing you had mentioned to me earlier today is the important part I think you said was getting to a graph, yeah. getting to a point where you had that decoupling whether it was right in some like fundamental sense or wrong was a lot less important. And the insight, I think if I have this right, and, and I'm curious, Shane, your take too, is once you're there, it's not so hard to maneuver. It's easy to change things. It's easy to add things. And, and I think maybe one of the biggest takeaways is, and I think what's behind the rapid rise of GraphQL is finally, we have an API technology that's agile. Like we, we have a way to, talk about the interface between systems that doesn't immediately lock us into this thing that you know, demands 18 months of design cycle and like measure 15 times before you cut lest you discover you're gonna be there for a long time. Is that, do I have that right or how, yeah, how do you think about it? You do and, I, and then I'm gonna pass to Shane for some real world examples but like we started out, so all of you that haven't maybe gone 
uh, some of you may have gone, have gone farther than we have, but we started out with this idea of really being curators of the graph, and we wanted to bring everybody up to this very pure, <coughs> beautiful description. And that worked for some teams, and other teams, all we did was just put them back to the design cycle, and they just looped, and they just looped and looped, and they never got any code out. And we realized, oh, this is not helpful. So maybe, Shane, you can share some examples of where we've learned how to move toward evolution versus perfection. Yeah, I mean, the, even just the example I gave in my slides, that is a pretty, pretty good example. We actually had kind of similar logic to these Boolean checks, right? We were doing Boolean checks in the client, and we realized that that's not working. Um, so the, the way that we kind of just go about is we add the new field for offer badge, um, and then we can just deprecate the client, or we deprecate the field, and we, now that we have these metrics, you can actually go back and quickly know, okay, I know today that there, no one is no longer using it, so I can actually delete your deprecated code instead of just trying to like guess when you're maintaining it, right? So it's, that's kind of allows us to do these quicker iterations, like we know who's using the fields, we can deprecate them. When you deprecate something, it immediately is communicated out to the, all the clients using it. So yeah, that helps us evolve quickly. Yeah, and the, and the other thing is like, so it's always important to keep your eyes on the prize. So we're all like, usually come from engineering backgrounds, and so we, this ideal beauty is such a siren's call. But we had a team just that just went through the process, and they like they had a summer sale coming up, and a big campaign, and they're like, we think we can add a whole another thing, finish our front, our whole shopping path, and get this thing out. Here's our schema. We're going to ship it in two weeks, and we're like two weeks, you haven't even coded against it and you're giving us, and there's, what kind of design cycle is that? And we were really like, and the schema was pretty deep and it wasn't just sort of shallow as we like. Um, but they said like, can we ship this and then we evolve it and iterate it? And actually we said, actually, not only yes, do it, go get your business goal, but you guys can be, uh, you can help us practice these patterns of deprecation. Cause they're not like, if, you can speak to this, but like, I think it's as important that we get good at that, yeah. at graph pruning and evolution. That was our, we were thinking of it as just right once. I think it's, it's not the fourth right principle, once. right? Yeah. yeah. You have to be agile. Um, yeah, awesome. Well, we have, uh, this is really the data graph team um, at Expedia, um, and I can make stuff up as I go. So uh, I just want to open it up for questions. What, what can, uh, what are people curious about or what can we answer? And maybe the easiest thing, I don't know if we have mics or I can just repeat. We have a mic coming. All right. It's not that. Yeah, I guess it's for, not, the, for, the, yeah. for the live cast people, maybe. Um, so I want to ask Shane and Dan about, you mentioned that there are schema review meetings for schema changes. Yeah. How often you run those meetings and what do you do to balance the policing and uh, autonomy of each team? What is your plan to scale up the process? <laughs> I guess I'll start, I'll start first with just uh, how, how do we initialize a schema review. Um, so uh, we currently have the teams that exist today, right? We're not just going out and creating brand new products. We're migrating existing teams to GraphQL and their existing products, their existing front ends. So like Dan mentioned, we have this new idea of the tech strategy. Um, so what we do is we, uh, we currently talk to teams who are not on the tech strategy and we just say, hey, look, this is the new thing going forward. We would like you to onboard. And once they say, okay, we're gonna start this onboarding process, that's when we say, okay, here's how you do GraphQL. Here's our SDK, use our template, fork the template. And let's, um, let's talk about you know, the technology of using GraphQL, but it's also first, even before you might even start doing writing any code, let's look at what your UI looks like today. And let's talk about what a schema might look like for that UI. Right. We don't just start in that visual appearance. So we often start a, a shareable documentation, uh, a shareable doc, so we can all just like take screenshots of UI and like write, ne write ne next to it, write a little mock, uh, mock code for a schema. And that just kind of triggers the process of like pushing people on board. Then once we say, okay, this kind of looks semi-good, go ahead and continue doing that template stuff, maybe write some code, and let's get that into uh, like a test environment, and let's just see if that schema works and maybe even hook it up to some live data. And that's where we're kind of trying to evolve this process of like, how long do we spend in that phase of like, you know, working on a shareable doc versus actually writing code? Or do we just let them write code right away and is that wasted effort? So that's where we're trying to find this balance, which you might be able to help talk about how we scale that for bigger teams. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got an intake. So it's, it's absolutely the case in the beginning that we were reaching out to teams. We were beating the bandwagon, bandwagon and evangelizing, hey, we got this new plan, come on board. And then, the onslaught comes, right? So they're like, hey. What triggered that? Um, so once 
there's two things. There's a class of, of services that, um, that are always looking for more customers. So a great, an insights one is like, so the main, you know, if you return hotel search results, people come to you. But if you return metadata about a destination, like I can tell you cool things about the, the top locations or the inventory compression or availability, like no one even knows about your service and so you're just starved. You're like, and you're trying to justify your existence. So you're looking for customers. So when we say, hey, we have this common graph, they're like, oh, I want to put my stuff in. So we had a bunch of teams like that. What was fascinating, so there's, there, there's like at least two or three different kinds of classes of customers that we engage with, right? And one of them internally was this, I've got some data, I want to put it in the graph. And you're like, okay, but <laughs> Jim is the best at this. He's like, who's going to consume this data? But I have this API, I want to put it in the graph. I go, okay, that's great. Where's the customer problem? So we can, well, what, uh, I just have this API, I want to put it in the graph. So there's, there's a process there. Um, and, and now the third group, so we had the customers that were, you know, the key tenants, if you will, and then we had folks that wanted to sort of set up kiosks and just stick their stuff in there. And then the third customer is, you've got hotel data in the graph, I can make one GraphQL call and get the same rich business object level stuff right out of the graph without having to onboard. And so we've got marketing teams and email teams and everybody else is like, oh my God, there's finally a place that I can get to, which has, I only need four things from the graph. I just need these four things and otherwise I'd have to do this very detailed integration that wasn't worth it. So now we're getting another class of customer who's saying, um, uh, you know, oh my God, I can't believe this stuff is in there. Now, the, and then we've got to navigate that uh, are they using it properly? Are they, and this is what you talked about, demand control is gonna be, we're all gonna be dealing with this over the next few years. It's like, it's great, it's in the graph. Oh shit, it's in the graph. Like everybody's just asking for it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a process, but to Vicky, to ask, answer your question about timing and, and scheduling, we're working through it. What we're realizing also is that central teams have all the bottleneck problems, right? They're usually, we're, we're distributed across a couple of the major time zones, but we, we don't yet have a full global footprint for the core team, so that's a problem, so we're trying to stretch that out. And then we, we've been looking at the embed model for the biggest teams. That's another factor you've gotta think about, is it's great to have an expert like Shane meet with you and do some blue gene meetings and stuff for a while, but sometimes we need some more prolonged engagements. So we've been thinking a lot more about this platform evangelism, success engineers, and I mean, all these different um, uh, advocate roles that we actually see, and they don't have to be developers necessarily, but they, they really have to be passionate about the graph. Uh, I think that that's gonna be a new job position, is that people who craft, because this, this mantra internally of the, the graph is the product is really starting to take hold for us. So, it's a great question. What else? Uh, I had a quick one uh, regarding federation and error handling. Uh, that's one thing that among different teams I've worked on over the years all do differently, the way they handle, whether it's the messages that come back or they want to have an error code in the response. And I was just curious uh, how you guys see federation. Are you guys aggregating those errors into a flat list or are we marking them where and from which service they originate from? And just like things like that to be able to gain insights from the developer's perspective in like a sandbox environment? Uh, I'll say at a high level, I, I think what you're describing is about right. Um, to me, errors are a really interesting property of GraphQL because we, um, it's an awful lot of rope, I'll put it that way. Uh, and there are, I think, one of the things we hear over and again is, what's, what's the right pattern on top of that? Like something even looking back to the days of Rails, just a basic out of the box story for how you're gonna wire up a database problem all the way to your UI without having to think too hard about it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, federation is exciting because it lets teams collaborate on a graph, but it really does put pressure on having a consistent pattern for that stuff because if the services don't agree, then you're, you're nowhere. So I'll just say for, for us at Apollo, that's an active area, sometimes we can, talk to a team like Dan's at Expedia and, uh, or, or, or you know, see a cache implementation and, and that's the light bulb for us and we understand based on that where to, where to take um, uh, sort of the core infrastructure. Sometimes, as with errors, we see lots of different things. And um, you know, I think we're at the point where we can 
start to lay out some, some best practices, but the idea that a GraphQL response can bring back a list of errors, partial results is another interesting pattern that I think, you know, something we can use for good if we're thoughtful about it. Uh, one of the cool things I think about the federation architecture is the gateway gives you a lot of resilience. Uh, if, if part of your graph is unavailable, in many cases, what's left is still really useful and you often want to return a partial result. You know, think about personalization data, for example. You're not going to take your app down for that. So there's a ton of interesting stuff I think we can build on top of, of, of those sort of building blocks. Um, uh, and and I'm, I'm eager to find more of a, a standard standard way that people can reuse. Yeah, yeah even at Expedia, uh, we're, we're still trying to figure out this error process. Uh, we don't have a, a best practice to find so far. Um, we kind of are, for the most part, since we have all the individual teams, like hotels, flights, uh, and they provide their service, they are the ones who understand that, oh, the search service failed versus the pricing service, right? That, that's up to them to decide what do we display back to the user. So uh, it's not really on top, of, it's not part of the you know, gateway's decision to try to implement a common error for that. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so to repeat for the live stream, he's just saying uh, it'd be nice to have, if we're doing this more federated model, it'd be nice to have an opinionated uh, view for basically the community. And we agree, we totally agree, because uh, we don't know the best approach yet, this is just our approach, and we've seen other companies do other approaches and they look kind of nice too, so we're, yeah, it's uh, error handling is definitely something the community as a whole should all uh, come together and try to you know, discuss. I think just to add to the previous question around uh, how this all how all of this fit together is particularly around us having those conversations early more from a product and engineering standpoint. I think we've already started having those conversations to just understand what does cohesiveness mean and how these error patterns evolve with time. So this kind of helps product define that scope for us so that we could actually design the error codes in a much more effective way. Just wanted to add that. With some of the early conversations we just started having from Expedia at this point. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Up here in the front, I'll just repeat it. I'm sorry. What's next for Apollo? What's next for Apollo? <laughs> there's, an there's an open ended question. <laughs> well, um, I think about it in terms of um, the stages of adoption and the best practices, the principles. And I think those two things add up to a pretty good roadmap in terms of what we're thinking about. So really, it's all about how do we help um, companies build a, a data graph? So the, the starting point for me is you're going to have some core APIs that aren't going anywhere. There are decades of investment in business logic and, and data and structure. And you've got a lot of apps. Um, and so you know, Dan mentioned. Um, well, actually, just to step back, I think it's, it's mostly all about collaboration. I think it's what are the tools and the patterns and the practices that let multiple developers and then multiple teams and then multiple organizations um, benefit from this new approach. And it's, it's going to be a change in terms of development process. It's a change in terms of um, you know, the very essence of an API used to be the, the service owner defined the surface area of the API and then you got to consume it and GraphQL is starting to turn that equation around, much more driven by products, especially the success cases we've seen. So it's a different kind of conversation and I think it's fair to say a lot of what we've heard over and again from uh, teams that are going down this path is I want more structure to the question about errors, I want more um, clarity about the right architecture and the right practices and I want more tooling to enforce that and, and take the burden off the development teams and, and, uh, and put it into the infrastructure. So, you know, some examples, Dan mentioned demand control. I've got a big graph. The graph gets large enough to the point where no one person understands every use case or every client that's consuming it. Services get published into the graph that may not have been built for the public internet or your main application to consume them. So this idea that we want sophisticated ways of governing what that traffic looks like and shaping that, I think, is, is an example. 
uh, of what comes up. Another area that's, I think, really important is, I mentioned at the start of the day, especially as you move into a model where you have multiple teams on a graph, you're gonna bump into all of the exciting stuff happening in cloud native infrastructure. Um, there's a really tight coordination there, I think, around how do we empower developers to make changes that propagate to the whole graph that are safe, but that are agile. We don't want developers mucking with the gateway, but we also want a good way for any team to have the ability to roll forward or roll back as necessary, um, you know, based on like what happens in the real world. So I think there's a whole bunch of stuff around all that um, space, but you know, maybe the, the pithy but real answer is it's, it's what we hear from teams that are building. Uh, you know, we're an open source company, we're transparent about what we're doing, and, and it's all based on real world needs that we've run into um, in the course of people building this stuff out. I'll ask you a question on the spot. Yeah. So uh, native apps are a big deal for Expedia, right? The customers that use them are really loyal. We get a really high percentage of the transactions from those. Yeah. Uh, from those. And you know where I'm going. What, so a lot of what we talked about today is sort of web-centric, which is pretty awesome because you can, you can push out a client and the, and the new um, scheme at the same time, and it's pretty easy to, to do that model, and you can deprecate pretty fast. Mm -hmm. You ship a binary. What, six months, year, year and a half? I mean, Facebook is still, what they say is they haven't deprecated their 1.0 queries, right? So you, you get this tension between the need to learn and iterate on our graph and make it better, because we, we mismodeled something. We're like, oh, I wish we hadn't done that. And I'm not talking about something that's extensible. I mean, it's literally mismodeled, and we want to yeah. replace it. Yeah. So one of the challenges we're having with is, how to balance the app team wanting to adopt really fast, maybe when we have a not so mature schema versus the web team, and there's pros and cons, and, we're, and we kind of seesaw back and forth. Um, so things like people have asked that team members uh, in Expedia have said like, oh, can, we, can we do an, is there an experimental? Can we put out a query that we mark as sort of like just to be used by some clients? Is there, how do we all manage this process of making better schemas and we get to agility but we don't have chaos, so that, that's a, I don't, I don't know if you guys have been thinking about that problem, but it's something that we have on our next quarter's objectives is to provide something to our community that lets them mark something as kind of a trial or an experimental and, um, and See, this is how this works. Now that's on the roadmap. Yeah. So there, now you know. Uh, it's really fast and easy. Um, I'll say a couple things about mobile. I think, I think you know, Dan's exactly right. Um, one way to hear what you just talked about is to think in terms of collaboration communication. So it's not just a schema where we've got types and fields. There's a lot more data that's gotta be there. You saw some of the value of having usage information there. Another kind of information that really belongs in, in this central schema is intent, policy, um, and ownership, I think. So there's a whole lot of questions that come up when a mobile developer wants to consume a certain part of the graph that Frankly, the stakes are a little higher because you can't, you can't ship a new client at the same time that you ship a new graph. So I think maturity of that stuff is, is part of the answer. Um, the other thing, just historically, it's interesting to me, GraphQL was really first developed for the needs of mobile developers where uh, network bandwidth is at its most premium uh, and just the, the ergonomics of being able to write queries instead of write all the data fetching code is, is so valuable. But, because of the momentum behind React, when GraphQL came out, it ended up being something that was stapled to React as a web technology. Uh, it's really valuable, we've found, that you can write your GraphQL implementation, your schema, in JavaScript, because that solves a lot of the chicken and egg problem. If you wanna have a new layer in your stack, who's gonna write it? Well, if we can have the, the web owner write it, and then eventually let that become its own thing with its own owner and its own, um, uh, maintenance model, that dramatically accelerates how fast you get adoption. And I think the other thing is if you just look around the web, most of the conversation around data graph and GraphQL is all in the language of web developers. The, the, the vocabulary is what resonates most with a React team or an Angular team. An example of that is a big value prop for Apollo Client for a lot of developers is state management. The idea is I can I can reflect my local state with GraphQL just like my remote data. I don't have to write all these reducers or you know, all this stuff, right? 
Mobile developers have been managing local state for a long time, and they're very good at it. And the tools are really sophisticated. And one thing we learned the hard way is uh, trying to apply the mindset of a web engineer to the needs of a mobile development team did not work at all. And uh, part of what we're doing in the second half of the year is a, a rev of our native mobile clients for iOS and Android that reflect that lesson and, and that take a, uh, an approach to GraphQL that lets you leverage the state management and the local data and the offline support that so many mobile apps need um, in an easier way. So I think part of it's tech, part of it's tools and process, a lot of it's education and um, conversation. Uh, but you roll all that up, we recommend the web team starts just because that's fastest and you're, you've got a little bit more room to experiment. But in every main use of the graph I can think of, the mobile team sits right next door and says, wait a second, why can't I query this? And the answer is you can. And, and so the, the momentum is, is driven as much by mobile, I think, as web. How are we doing on time? Maybe one more question, two more questions? One more question. Ian, yeah. I'll repeat this at the end, but go yeah, ahead. Right? Yeah. Um, so, like for, for Tika, for example, it sounds like you guys have relatively similar UX across all your different clients, sort of the last time. But I'm curious, like, have you guys had any challenges with clients that have a wildly different UX or like services you do your, your team and what you need to expect? Like, how do you balance a team that works with one client with all your users? Yeah, I mean. Let see, me repeat a question real yeah, quick for our, our, our people online. Ian's asking, sounds like the best way to do this in terms of schema design is to reflect the needs of the application or the UX. I agree with that, by the way. Um, how true is it at Expedia that all these different clients have the same UX? How do you deal with a situation where a client may have a completely different user experience or shape? What about you know, ad hoc consumers of the graph that are just nothing like that? How do you balance that? Yeah, so to give an example, most what you might be thinking of is like we have our web applications, native apps, but then we have like Alexa, right? Like that's, that's just a pretty simple bot. All it needs is really just like some text. Um, this is kind of for us where just the, that actually is that's where GraphQL is the benefit where the Alexa team can write a query to just, you know, query the hotel search and really all I need is the name of the hotel because that's all I say. All right, the, I don't need to get the images, I don't need to get the badges, I just need to get the name of the hotel, and that's the benefit of GraphQL. So we still design our schemas for um, our design system, um, not necessarily like each individual app. We say like, look, hotel search should look pretty much the same across web and native, so we can design a schema meant for that. Um, and then if we need very specific features for very specific clients, one, we should talk to those teams about why, but if they are valid, then we can actually add those into the graph and then the clients who don't need them, don't query them. Uh, that's kind of where our GraphQL fits in there. Yeah, I mean, it's a great general question. In, in general, um, the, the answer is usually um, if you focus on the product, and that's the word I'm stealing from your first intro talk, is we've been saying client-centric, but really what we mean is product-centric, right? If, you, if your designers are designing their product right, they're thinking about the same fundamental notions, and I think this is a loop we haven't yet connected, is getting the design team who thinks about these abstract concepts to, to be part of that scheme of design process, because it's literally the same design is design, and so what is it that your thing is? It's a collection of X's, right? It's, it's, and so whether that shows up in a carousel or a list, that's not so interesting, but the fact that there's a list of things that you can filter, yeah, that, that is a fundamental truth. And whether you're a chat app and you want the top three, or you're a PWA app and you want the top 20 and you have an infinite scroll, both of those fit into the same paradigm. So what I've been telling people, and there's a lot of consternation with a lot of developers we've talked to who've said, you're binding the API to the, to the front end. Like, you're, you're binding them. You're, you're, why is it so tied together? And we've said, we're not trying to bind them. We're trying to relate them. Because if you don't, if you take this purest sense of a pure data you know, semantic API, what you get is a, sh a lot of, <laughs> you get a lot of client code. You get a lot of JavaScript. You get a lot of objective and now, now Swift. You get a lot of code. And that doesn't really help anybody. So, so I think that we're, I think as a community though, we're all gonna have to figure this out. Like what is that balance between 
what is the pure platonic product concept and what is the surface level UI stuff. Um, we're really excited about moving to like what, what folks uh, are talking about server driven UI. Like we're really excited by this idea, like as we mentioned for test and learn, but we don't really know, we haven't got it cracked. So we'll share what we learn with all of you and hopefully you do the same because I think it's a great opportunity to see us, you know, leverage the work that we're all doing together. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, appreciate it. Round of applause. I, I just can't say it enough. It's a, it's a community. We are literally changing the way people write software, and I mean we in the broadest sense. And uh, this is a, a really exciting opportunity I don't think comes along all that often uh, for us to make something really great for a lot of people. So I hope that this was helpful for everyone who came here. Uh, we've got some time afterwards to, to talk and, and share more. And um, uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Shane, and, and everyone else who uh, has been uh, building this stuff. Thanks a lot.